Today, Pastor Mark Nisimbi will be sharing the message from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. You can follow along starting on page 737 in the Pew Bibles in front of you or on the screen above. Hear the word of the Lord. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to him to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of the Lord. So let's, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we are grateful for this day, and King Jesus, we lift up your name, and we ask that as we dive into your word, that you would open our eyes to truly see you for who you are, O oh God. Um, and so we surrender ourselves to you. May you take your place. May you have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, this season, we've been focusing on the theme of being seen. Um, and in that same spirit, today, we're going to actually turn the cameras around um, from us being seen to actually seeing Jesus, to seeing Jesus. Um, and as I read through this, you know, Palm Sunday passage, and as also you read through the book of John, you'll realize that he wrote this gospel in hindsight perspective. And they say hindsight is 2020, right? Um, meaning that one is able to evaluate past events more clearly than at the time of the event. So according to John, no one actually really knew who Jesus was or what he had come to do. Everyone had his or her own understanding and expectations of Jesus. So the disciples, the crowd, the Pharisees, all of them had their own perspective of who Jesus really was. And I feel like I can you know, identify with, with John and what he's trying to convey, because growing up, um, I grew up in a, I attended a Catholic school for 12 whole years, and um, I was one of the few non-Catholics there. And as I went through elementary school and you know, middle school and high school, I was also growing in my faith, and I became very, very critical of Catholicism, um, especially the Pope. Um, and part of it was really because of the information that one of my my brothers, not Ken, not James, okay? Um, but one of my brothers told me, and that he was feeding us, right? Um, he would tell us that the Pope wears a hat to cover the number 666, right, <laughs> on his head, which in the book of Revelation is a mark of the evil one, right? And so my brother just really drilled into us that the Pope was evil and that Catholics are merry worshippers, that their infant baptism is so fake because they only drop you know, they only like pour drops of water on the head. And if you read in the Bible, it's supposed to be a full immersion, right? So my brother would just go on and on, just, you know, just making us doubt Catholicism and Catholics, and especially the Pope, because I had never seen his hat come off, right? <laughs> um, but I actually found a picture. I don't know if they can put up the picture. Um, and the picture actually has his hat off, unless it's all the way back here. But, it, you know... But anyway, after high school, I went to Bible school and I got to familiarize myself with other religions and you know, with, with other denominations too and with the Catholic faith. And I began to listen to the teachings of Pope John Paul II and Pope Be um, Benedict and the current Pope, Pope Francis. And some of you may disagree with me, but I honestly think that these are the most godly, some of the most godly men on the face of this earth. Um, so I can tell you that now, in hindsight, my perspective of Pope John Paul II was way off. For a very long time, I saw the Pope the way I wanted to see him. I saw him from the misinformed picture that my brother had painted of him as an agent of the evil one. But unfortunately, it is also true that there are some popes in the history of the Catholic Church who have done very evil things very evil things. But to believe, 
you know, that anyone who sits in the position of Pope is evil is not true. And some of you may disagree with me because of your understanding of Catholics, but I don't think that is true. You know, just follow the Pope. Yes, follow the Pope. Join me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, going back into the passage, you know, John is, in his gospel, he's trying to show us in hindsight how the disciples, how the crowd and how the, uh, how the Pharisees perceived who Jesus was in that moment as he was entering into Jerusalem riding, um, riding on a donkey. The crowds have been trying to make Jesus their king for a very long time. In chapter 6, actually, John tells us that the crowd that was beside the lake, when they saw Jesus turning um, the five loaves and, 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 and the two fish, you know, and feeding their 5,000 people through the, just this little portion of food, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. And the word began to spread, and the crowd's zeal for Jesus began to grow. And so they decided to make him king on the spot. And Jesus knew it. And so John says this. says, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountainside by himself. The crowd wanted to make Jesus their kind of king. But Jesus was not going to give in to the expectations. And so in today's passage, again, the crowd that was getting ready for the Passover festival has the same idea. They want to make Jesus their kind of king. The crowd hears that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. And so the crowd comes together with palm branches. I'm going to make you not like palm branches today, so you're going to return them. Um, but, you know, they come with their palm branches and they go out to meet Jesus, singing his praises with a quotation from the book of Psalms 118, 25 to 26. It says, save us, O Lord, which means Hosanna. Save us, O Lord. O Lord, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Bless, we bless you from the house of the Lord. So once again, the crowd wants Jesus to become their kind of king, their expected national and political messiah. And if you think about it, no one who was waving those branches in the crowd wanted or expected Jesus to be willing to go to the cross. If they had come, you know, from the lake where he had fed the 5,000, or if they had come from Bethany where Jesus had raised Lazarus, they were looking for a miracle worker. John says in verse 17 that was read today, and 18, now the crowd was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, um, Sorry, when the, when the crowd that was with him, when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word, many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And not everyone came because they believed in Jesus. Because in the same chapter, John says in verse 37, that even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. So there was a mix of people in the crowd. Some came genuinely, yes, but many of them came because they wanted to be entertained. Fear of missing out, right? The circus is in town and it's free, right? Let's go get entertained with some miracles and we might even get some free food. I would be there, right, <laughs> if I had free food. Um, so Jesus was literally being perceived as an entertainer, but there was also some in the crowd, you know, some of these people expected a revolutionary, you know, to throw the Roman Empire out. And in the ancient days, in the time of Jesus, palm branches, um, the palm branches that were being waved were actually a sign of victory. Um, and, the, and the expression Hosanna, as we say, literally means Lord save us. So the crowd was expecting Jesus to bring them victory over the hopelessness and the oppression that they were experiencing. And Jesus was being perceived by these people as a political messiah who was going to bring them freedom. And in that moment, as Jesus rode into Jerusalem, everyone in the crowd thought that they had the right perspective of who he was. They thought, you know, they were, and, they were, and they actually were kind of right in hailing Jesus as a messiah. But in hindsight, according to John, they were deeply wrong because they were all cheering for the very wrong reasons, all the wrong reasons. And so everyone wanted to see Jesus the way they wanted to see him. 
because the expectations of Jesus that they created in their mind was that he was going to meet all their hopes and all their needs. No one understood in that moment, not even the disciples, that Jesus was a different kind of king. And before you know, we move on to what Jesus does, let's fast forward to today and pause and reflect for a moment about how we seek to make Jesus our kind of king. How do we make Jesus support our cause? You know, are we happy to wave palms and sing songs to Jesus as long as he is our kind of king? So what expectations do we as a community lay on Jesus? You know, perhaps that, oh, he agrees with all my religious and theological views. Or maybe that he will or will not be political. Or maybe that he supports my political party, right? Or that, oh, he supports all my views on justice. Or maybe that Jesus is all about hype and entertainment, you know? Um, I was reading this passage in this article in Christianity Today that a friend emailed me about an interview that was done for pastors um, about their first for pastors who are from outside the U.S. about their first impressions of Christianity in the U.S.A. And here is what they say: the question was, "What was your first? What was the first thing you noticed that was different from your home country?" And Wilma Ramirez, director of Hispanic initiatives at Denver Seminary who moved from Boston after pastoring in nine years from Guatemala. He quickly realized that churches spoke a different language, not just English instead of Spanish, but a different set of assumptions. This is what he says. The first service I attended, Ramirez recalls, the pastor was announcing upcoming events, and he said, be sure to come. You'll have a blast. And I thought, said Ramirez, I never had that in Guatemala. Almost every event was presented in a similar way, highlighting how much fun it would be, not how you'd find purpose for your life or learn to walk with God. And I wondered if having a blast was the most important thing for Christians in the USA. First impressions. And when I read what Pastor Ramirez you know, said, my first reaction was, ouch. That was painful. That was painful, and I don't know how you feel when you hear that, but for me, as, as someone who stands up here and also someone who um, you know, does announcements, I felt called out. I felt called out. Am I just calling people to, you know, do I just come here to entertain people or you know, just to have fun, or are we here to really praise the name of Jesus, the King? And so, I also realize that there is definitely a lot that the global church can learn from each other. There is a lot that we can learn. We have to be careful about creating our own kind of perspective of who Jesus is or what Christianity is and assuming that it reflects or represents what Christ is all about. We have to be careful about the subtle ways in which we make Jesus our kind of king. And so what kind of expectations do we as a community place on Jesus? You know, there are times that we really need to be clear and honest. You know, that as we wave the palms and sing Hosanna, that we are joining the crowd in celebrating our expectations. And the least we can do is at least to know them and to name them. Jesus did not come to meet our expectations. Jesus did not come to be our kind of king. And if we are to see Jesus for who he really is, then we know that Jesus is committed to being God's kind of king. And that's the good news, that Jesus is committed to being God's kind of king. And so we go back into the passage. You know, with all these expectations from the crowd, what does Jesus do? Jesus enters the city in humility. He comes in as a king and not as the type of king that the crowd expected. Jesus enters the city seated on a young donkey, which is actually the sign of a peaceful mode of transportation, unlike a, a, a horse, which is a war animal. He corrects the crowd's expectations by sitting on a donkey and signaling that he has not come to lead a riot or a, re, 
or a rebellion. Jesus is not just going to, you know, he's, he's, he was not coming to use force to usher in the kingdom of God. He was not coming as a hero or a warrior, but as a humble king, and therefore turning everyone's expectations upside down. So this was completely opposite of what everyone in the crowd expected of the Savior, who they expected was going to deliver them, to deliver their nation. However, people continued to blindly cheer and celebrate and welcome Jesus because they thought that, yes, we finally convinced him to become our kind of king. And at the moment, Jesus knew that he was the anticipated king that was prophesied in the Old Testament, but the crowd together with the disciples did not really grasp it. The Gospel of John tells us, you know, that the disciples will not get it until after the resurrection, when they finally put the pieces, you know, when they'll finally put the pieces together. But some of them didn't even get it after the resurrection. They did not really figure out who Jesus was until later. And actually, the early church itself took a long time to understand what the gospel was all about and who Jesus really was. It took over 300 years after the ascension of Christ for the church to agree on who Jesus really was. Um, we're told that at the Council of Nicaea in AD 325, the church actually came together to settle the, theological, the, the, the Christological issue of the divine nature of God the Son and his relationship to God the Father. And this is actually where we get our creed, um, our statement of faith from. And so this is where we actually see the grace and the mercy of God in the gospel, that he is so patient with us even when we don't get it. He is so patient with us. And as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, he knew that no one gets it. No one gets it. No one saw him for who he really was. Not the crowd, not the Pharisees, and not even the disciples who were with him for three whole years. Jesus knew that it was going to take more than three years for these people to understand what kind of king he was. You know, he knew that the crowd and the disciples that showing them a new way was going to take a longer time than was expected. So understanding the kingdom of God, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like hearing a joke for the first time and you don't get it. And then you wake up in the middle of the night laughing because all of a sudden something clicked, right? And you finally get it. Jesus had to explain almost every parable about the kingdom of God to his disciples because they didn't get it. He had to explain the joke to them, like, come on, guys, you don't get it, right? And I read a quote from the book White Awake that Anna Kalepo and Michelle Heiser are going to be leading um, a study on, and this is what it says. There is a reality that belongs to God alone, and Jesus is the one that ushers us into it. This is a journey that he longs to lead us on, and a journey we're invited to participate in. But the price of admission is a full acknowledgement of our utter blindness. Only when we embrace our lack of sight can we authorize Jesus to begin the process of illuminating the truth that we so badly need to see. Only when we authorize Jesus, only when we let him, can, we, can he open our eyes to see that truth of the kingdom of God. And I think it is, it is a dangerous thing when we think that we've completely figured out Jesus and the gospel. When we think that we fully get him, that there's nothing new to learn about Jesus, about the kingdom, then we easily become like the crowd that is actually hailing Jesus to become their kind of king and not the kind of king that God sent. And so when we stop pursuing who Jesus is and when we stop pursuing his kingdom, that's when we stop seeing Jesus for who he really is. And the most dangerous part of that is that, you know, when we begin to do this, that's when we begin to misrepresent Jesus and the gospel. In that same article that I read earlier on um, from Christianity Today, one of the interviewees said this. On the other hand, the long history of Christianity in the U.S. 
leads to, all, leads to its own sort of resistance. It is hard for the gospel to feel new here. Most people have had some form of Christianity from culture references to it in the media, but they've often had a perversion of it. So the resistance isn't to the gospel as often as it is to some misrepresentation of it. My hope is that we can enter with humility into these conversations and instead of defending our religion, introduce folks to the person of Jesus. My hope is that we will enter with humility into these conversations and instead of defending our stance of who we think Jesus is, that we would introduce people to the person of Jesus. People are not rejecting the gospel. Instead, they're, re they're rejecting the expectations that we have tacked onto the gospel, onto Jesus. They're rejecting the image of Jesus that we have presented to them. Sorry, I didn't expect to cry. <laughs> I believe that when people encounter the real Jesus, they will not be able to reject him. So what I'm saying is that let us be lifelong disciples. Let us be lifelong learners of Jesus. Let us not pause on the journey that we are on because we think that we finally figured out who Jesus is. Let us not let Jesus become our kind of king. Let us let Jesus become the king that God sent us. The humble king who came not to overthrow nations, but the one who came to conquer sin and death and to restore our relationship with God. The kind of king who came to set us free from fear and to draw us into a loving relationship with God. And so at the end of the passage, John says, now the crowd was with him when he, when he called, sorry, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus out from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that, that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. Um, even though in hindsight, you know, people were going to see Jesus for the wrong reasons, John really emphasizes that the crowd continued to testify, to give witness, which is a major theme in the Gospel of John. Come and see. And so the invitation for all of us, for all our friends, for our community, for all our co-workers is to come and see. And the advantage that we have right now is that we have the hindsight vision. And so together we can wave our branches at the right kind of king, the king that God sent to us. And so I'd like to invite the worship team to come up, invite us to stand up too, and to take some time and to reflect and to really come and see Jesus in this new light that we may lay down our expectations of him and ask him to open our eyes so that we can see him as the king that he truly is. And I would also not like to pass this moment. If there's anyone here who has not accepted Christ as their Lord and King, please come and pray with the prayer team. Please come and pray with me up here. I would love to, um, to welcome you um, and so that you can come and let God, let Jesus be your king. So let us take some time to worship. <laughs>